Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Painted in Color podcast. I am co-host Lauren Brown, joined here by Mia Araujo, our other co-host. And today we're going to talk about planning a big project. And we both have uh, big projects that we're working on, so we're just going to discuss them, how we approach them, what our struggles are with our projects, and how we plan to proceed with them. And hopefully you get some advice out of this talk that'll be useful for your big project as well. So, Mia, how are you doing? Doing good. I'm kind of tired, but yeah. <laughs> I don't, I think that's uh, that's pretty much my standard answer for this whole year. <laughs> when are we not tired? <laughs> it doesn't matter how much sleep is involved. It's always just like my brain is just like overloaded. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I feel. Yeah, I was I was just talking like earlier. Just I feel really generally just mentally exhausted, even though I feel like I haven't done anything. And it's just I think part of it is just the strain of thinking that you need to do something so often that it just wears on you as if you've done all these things but you haven't and so it's just it's the worst of both worlds is really what it is yeah it really is but um you know hopefully we can push through definitely and it's almost like you get so used to like at least for me for years of working at least two jobs that when you're not you just feel like i need to be working that much you know Mm -hmm. and so right now, like I I'm just working on this project, but it just feels like I need to fill 60 hours a week, at least with this project. Otherwise I'm not getting anything done. That's what it feels like. And that's not right, but that's, you know, not 60, like 40, (laughs) maybe, but 60, no, like that's, that is 20 hours over time. We don't do this. Yeah. No, don't don't follow my advice. (laughs) That's not even (laughs) advice. I'm just saying this is bad programming. (laughs) Mm -mm, Yeah. It's just, it's what we gotten used to and the expectations of this hyper working society where if you're not spending every hour working or you're not spending all this time being productive then what are you even doing and i think that's really ridiculous because you know i think this is why we have such a bad relationship with actually resting and allowing ourselves to recharge is because we come from this culture of work 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 and you know you you sleep and you eat but that's really it like you don't you know you have to be a productive member of society you have to always be contributing and no, we, we can't contribute if we're burnt out all the time. It's just not going to work that way. Yeah. <laughs> we have to have healthier habits, but it's the same with me though. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure I do work 60 hours a week just by virtue of my full-time job. And then, you know, having my freelance and, you know, my, my other work that I want to get done. So mm-hmm. yeah, even though I'm just like, don't do 60 hours. Like, oh no, I'm doing it too. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about that. Oh no. Sorry. <laughs> But actually, case in point, since we're talking about big projects, you know, I think that we should just say that it's like, I I think part of what the draw for every artist to do a big project or something epic, you know, is that you we kind of um, like if we have a day job, even if it's an art job, that's not necessarily the thing we want to make. There's always Mm -hmm. that nagging feeling in your head that you're just like, I need to make this thing that fulfills me. And that thing is going to be so big, you know, or and so ambitious. And I mean, at least for for perfectionists, or you know, there's there's some of us who maybe just are too unrealistic. But I think that everybody probably has that in common in the sense that that if you went into art for wanting to make your own stories or tell your you know tell your own stories, make your own art, um, chances are your day job, especially early on in your career, is probably not fulfilling those things. And so there is that need to make something else, and that is adding more hours to your work week, you know. So. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess what I would say to that is it's okay to have that need, but you don't, there's, there's this like instant gratification that we all crave right now too, that it's like, I want that thing and I want it now. I want that project and I want it to be done right now. And that's, you know, my project has taken eight years and it's still not done. And it's like, that has tortured me in so many ways, but at the, at the end of the day, it's like the thing is getting made. It's, yeah. it's moving along that, that honestly is is the sort of like realistic bar I wish I had in the beginning because I wouldn't have stressed so much about that aspect of it if I had just been realistic with myself and saying the ambitious project I had in mind with a full-time job is just not going to happen any sooner. It's just not, you know? It definitely isn't. And that's my issue too. I feel like the things that I was creating wasn't valid enough unless it was something that was big and epic and, you know, something that could impact so many people. And it spans across different kinds of medias of you know, a book and a comic and, a, you know, like maybe I'll pitch it as a show. And I'm like, what am I, like, what am I doing though? Like, <laughs> why, why does that have to be this huge thing? It's not that, it shouldn't be that important. It should be that pressing, but it's still something that I can admit that I've always wanted to try to make. But 
I put so much pressure on myself to, to get it done. And like you said, the instant gratification aspect that I haven't really stopped to appreciate the journey and to appreciate how I've actually grown throughout the process of making this project and matured. Uh, I was just looking at my Google doc of like one of my first drafts that I had of it recorded from 2013. And I was like, wow, it was such a, you know, an ambitious baby, but it's nice to see those baby steps too, because I was really enjoying it back then. And then it started to become more stressful when I was like, well, I'm not doing this in a way that I feel like it's good enough or that I can give it justice. And I'm just like, why don't I just enjoy the process and allow myself to learn and grow and know that whatever the first iteration of this project is, it doesn't have to be the only time I ever make something big. Like it, this is not the end all be all of my life. Yeah. Like it, I'm gonna keep creating as long as I'm breathing air. So why am I stressing so hard about the fact that it might not be perfect? Like, of course it's not gonna be perfect. It's something that I made, I'm a human. Yeah. Like it's, it's normal for it not to be perfect, but um, I'm still trying to fight through the stress of trying to make something that's at, at least good or you know readable or something that people can engage with because I'm like, oh, if I, if I spend all this time, I hope people will see it. But I don't even know if it's really about that. I don't think it should be about how many people are gonna see it. I just wanna, I just wanna tell the story. I've always just wanted to tell the story. And I think that it's good to remind yourself of that and step back from it a little bit and just be like, what do I actually want out of this project? Do I want a bunch of recognition? Do I want a bunch of money? Do I want a bunch of, you know, uh, like fame? Do I want to be catapulted to get a job? Do I want to, you know, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It could be any amount of goals. Or do I just want to tell my own story and then whatever comes from that, I hope people can get something out of it like I did. And I think that's important to have that conversation with yourself at the very, at the very beginning or during the journey of the project. It's like keep reevaluating re what you want to say with it. That's definitely what I've been trying to do. It's been really hard to, to level with myself about the answer to that question, but you know, it's something that I had to remind myself of often. Absolutely. I'm, I think it's so important that you said that, but I think honestly, like if you, if your goal is money, fame, et cetera, et cetera, and it's a project that might take like 10 years, like it has to be, I think it has to be something stronger and more personal that will get you through those hard times because oh, yeah. Cause that's something too, like the blue sky period alone of just like development and ideation and stuff like that is usually in any project is unless you're working for a studio, but if it's a self, you know, generated project, you are pretty much not going to make any money during that time, you know? Oh, absolutely not. And actually the people who can monetize their process, either A, already have a big following or B, or like an established artist in some other field that can bring that, you know, that, I guess, that platform with them to support something new, a new endeavor. But if you are you know, in any way, not in the, either of those two categories, I would, I would just from off the bat, just expect that it won't make you any money until the thing is done. Yep. And then, and then in the end, it still might not. So after all, everything's said and done, if you weren't going to make any money out of it, would you still have done it? You know? And I feel like if you're saying yes, then definitely go for it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good litmus test of if you're dedicated to the project, knowing that you're not going to, you know, have that financial support from it or like maybe you do, but a lot of times you won't and you have to be okay with that. Um, you have to be okay with the slog of mm -hmm. it as well, because a lot of parts of it, like, you know, when, you, when you're at the very, when you're at the ground floor of a big project, you have all these ideas. You have all these things that you want to accomplish. You're like, wow, I can tell such an amazing story and I know exactly what I have to do. And then you actually get to the doing and the doing is, probably 99.9% .9 of the reason that most big projects don't get done in the first place, because you get in there and you realize that some of these parts are not fun. Some of these parts are painful, like outright just difficult and awful. And you dread approaching some of those parts, but the people who have gotten those big projects done are the people who got to those sections of the project and did it anyway. And they got it done despite the slog and despite the difficult times because they believed in it so much. So it's really, you know, about keeping yourself motivated and, and finding kind of that reason and that spark of like why you're making this project in the first place, because sometimes you have to remind yourself, it's like, this is why I'm doing this and this sucks right now, but it's going to be worth it in the end mm -hmm. because I, I believe in this and I want people to see it. So I'm just going to push through it and hopefully I get out the other side. 
but first and foremost, you have to really level with yourself. I think it's really important to be realistic at, you know, eventually about the projects, like maybe not at the beginning, because if you're realistic, then maybe you won't get it. You won't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but at a certain point, you really have to say like, do I have the will to get through all of these hard parts of the projects of writing the thing, of planning the thing, of then, you know, like actually doing, depending on what it is, I mean, it could be anything, it could be a comic, it could be a book, you know, it, it could be anything, but like doing like the, the nitty gritty parts of it, like the editing and figuring out like what else, what illustrations are gonna go with which page? Like there's so many different things to consider when you have something big on your plate that, you know, you really have to understand what each part is gonna look like. It's good to visualize how it's going to be by getting through. And I found vis visualization has helped me a lot and just kind of setting up expectations for myself about what something should look like. You know, nine times out of 10, if I don't visualize something, it'd be really hard for me to actually sit down and start doing it. But once I do, then I'm like, well, I know what this should look like at the very least. So I'm going to, I'm going to actually like realize that vision and see how accurate my vision actually was. And sometimes it's off the mark and sometimes it isn't, but it helps. It helps for sure to, to kind of manage your expectations in the beginning. Yeah. Or during the journey. I'm glad you said that about not being too realistic in the beginning because I think there needs to be a time for play, a time for just like, I want to explore to see if I even want to like commit to this project and marry this project for however many years of my life, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think when you do decide, you're like, yes, this is the thing I want to do. This is the thing I want to spend thousands and thousands of unpaid hours into and <laughs> my heart, blood, sweat and tears into, you know, like I, I think it is really important to um, kind of like what I was saying in the, inter in the interview you guys did of me where I wish people told me when I decided to do a solo show that you're going to be painting for an entire year for free and then you might get paid for, for it. And then like, so just once you've decided you want to do this, I would just, like we said, expect not to make any money for most, if not all of it and figure out how you're going to do that. And there's different ways, you know, like if some people have a significant other that's willing to foot the bill for part of the time. But I feel like if that is your route, you need to be a hundred percent like transparent with that person and almost, and be, hold yourself accountable. If you're having somebody else support you to make sure that they're not just holding this kite string forever, you know, and that you're actually following through and almost treat it like an investor, you know, like they're your partner, but it's not the responsibility to, to fund your dream. You know, even if they want to, I feel like that's just a healthy way to go about it. Um, another way obviously is having a day job, whether that's an art job, whether there's a non-art job. And obviously that's comes into the balancing the hours of the week territory that we talked about at the beginning in terms of a full-time job that might be 40 hours. And then you work on your project in evenings and weekends. And yeah. then another option too is grants. And I feel like a lot of people don't talk about that enough, but and I certainly have just done the research side of it, but not have not, not applied to them. But when your project is like, you have enough, you know, to show and to sort of maybe even a track record to show that you have completed other work. Uh, there is, especially in states like California, there's a lot of art grants out there that you can apply for and try to, you know, get some funding in that way in terms of getting your project made and stuff like that. So I just think it's just really important to be upfront with yourself in terms of the financial investment and make sure that you can do that and that you're not just like spending all your savings trying to get this thing done and uh, running yourself into the ground or living off of credit cards. Don't do that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's really important to like, have a plan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like once you have, a, have more of a sense of what this project is going to entail and whether or not you have a full-time job or you don't, actually planning out what it's gonna look like. How much time do I need to get this thing done? Um, you know, like how many, like, sometimes the project blows up and you have no idea how many hours that something is going to take just because like you, you iterate and you iterate but at least under getting an understanding of how you're going to make money while you're doing it or how you're going to do it while you're making money is really really important so for example you know you can one of the suggestions is if you get people who have some buy into the project if you get people who are excited about what you're doing give little snippets of it, give little previews, um, kind of gently introduce people into your world. A Patreon could be a good way to introduce people to your process and to let them know how you work if you feel confident and comfortable enough in it. But that might not come immediately. That might, that might take some time. Mm -hmm. But having an idea of, <clears throat> of what your resources are and what your options are is really is a really good way to start. And grants is a, is a really good thing that you brought up. So thank you for bringing that up. I personally don't know that much about applying to grant programs, but 
is something that can easily that can definitely be researched. And I'm sure there's a lot of options out there for people uh, to you know get a grant to work on something that they really believe in. I think that that's an amazing avenue. Yeah. Um, you know, like I think right now people put a lot of stock in Kickstarter um, mm -hmm. and just you know in the crowdfunding aspect of it, which is a viable plan. But what you have to understand is that Kickstarter takes a lot of work. It's like a full-time job. <laughs> people have described it as a full-time job. It is a lot of maintenance, a lot of planning, a lot of, you know, who's your manufacturer? How do you get the word out there? How do you advertise? Like, there's just so many things that you have to consider when doing a Kickstarter. And it's not the only option is the thing too. But that's definitely an option to fund. Um, you know, just do you work a part-time job while you're doing your big project? Are you in a full-time job already? Like, you know, like I am. Um, and if you're in a full-time job, how do you organize your time and parse it out enough that you have the capacity and energy? Mm -hmm. the, the energy part is really important because yeah. your girl knows deeply that the energy part is really important, yeah. but how are you going to manage your time? Um, how do you give yourself enough breaks in between to not burn yourself out on this project? Um, as somebody who has done a big project before, I can tell you that, you know, like going super hard on something for a really long time, is not a good idea. Like it might be like, it's a, it can be a passion project or whatever, but I think the last time I did a big project, I permanently burned something out of myself. <laughs> like just whatever that drive was that got me done with that project and maybe six it was six months 125 pages oh fully God. illustrated pages i'm not kidding yeah it was um for? it was for uh it was when i was still in college because i was young and had energy to do something like that but it was uh it was a project that i had a long time ago um about it was about a computer virus who gained sentience and gained her like own body and everything and explored the world and not well not explore the world but just explored what it meant to be alive basically and you know and kind of like there's a lot of things about self-image and stuff like that it was a really important story to me it still is but awesome. yeah but oh my goodness <laughs> after that was done <laughs> i was like wow why can't i do that again i wonder why i wonder why yeah, <laughs> I wonder why. yeah it's, it's just gone yeah but um so understand about how much effort it's going to take and then also pacing yourself and knowing that you need to rest and take breaks and, you know, just enjoy the journey and know that the gratification isn't going to be immediate. Yeah. So perhaps one of the things that you can do is find moments in there that you have like little bits of instant gratification. Like if you finish an illustration for this project or if you finish a page for it or something like that, maybe those are the moments that you can really appreciate rather than, you know, like waiting into the end of the road, you know, waiting until the thing is finalized because, you know, you, Mia, you have a, a lot of illustrations for this project already. Like you've been introducing the world to it slowly, but surely. And I'm really curious to talk about, you know, your process and what that feels like to get each piece out and to see the reception behind it. Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, like in the beginning, I feel like I started this back in 2012, 2013, something like that. And it, for a long time, it was just, in, it lived in my sketchbooks and it was just, how will this look? Like you said, visualization and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but something that was, and I've talked about this in other interviews and stuff. So uh, I apologize for repeating myself, but I realized back then I was like, this project is very ambitious and my skills are just not up to par. So I took time to, to develop my like foundational skills that I feel like stuff that I didn't learn properly in college. Uh, and I feel like that's a really important thing too, is, is constantly being really like honest with yourself when you're doing something that's this ambitious and just being like, you know what, this is not coming out the way I want it to. I'm going to pause right now and work on those skills. And in the, while I was doing that, I was also trying to figure out the story um, and, you know, storyboarding it out or just in like, you know, uh, no cards and things like that. And that has changed uh, for over so many years. Um, but I think the thing that really helped me, like starting in 2016, um, so actually before 2016, I've been going to conventions and seeing people like Armand Baltazar with his timeless booth and all that sort of thing. And I actually didn't really plan on doing that myself, but I was just almost like filling my brain with all these other projects and seeing how other people did it. So, so there was an aspect of researching too, seeing how people put their own projects together and put them out there and stuff. 
Um, and I was definitely of the mindset where I, I didn't want to share my project at all until it was done. But seeing people like Armand who were sharing it before it was done and that sort of thing, I realized that it's like actually shows like gallery shows and conventions was a great way to enforce external deadlines on your own project. And I think that is incredibly important because you can stay in this development hell thing for your own project for years and just never get it done. But until there's, especially if you're not sharing it with anyone, especially if you're not telling people, hey, I'm making this thing. I think accountability is super important. So whether it is a deadline for a show, like this needs to happen, or right now that we're in the pandemic, you know, maybe you're not signing up for events, but maybe you say, you announce on social media and say, hey, twice a year, I'm going to do a fire sale. We're going to have a bunch of new work. And that's how you you commit to making a bunch of new work for your project or whatever, you know, but you're, you're using like other people's expectations of you in, in a certain way <laughs> to like get work out of you. So that's what I was doing. I was like, every show I was going to, I was doing one more Alice piece, like one more painting. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, that was a process too. It was just like, oh, I think it'll look like this. And then a few pieces later, it's like, oh, I've changed the design a little bit, but I was just, you know, again, just using those deadlines to crawl a little bit closer to that finish line in terms of where I am right now or, you know, where I'm going to be in the future. Um, but yeah, a lot of the art that I've made, you know, won't be used and that's fine because it needs to be done for you to develop your project too. And same with writing. A lot of the writing I've done is not going to make it in the final form, but it had to be written for me to know where the story is now. So all that stuff is like pretty much unpaid work. Um, but at the same time, you know, like some of the pieces like there's one character in particular, like his design is completely different and I'm not saying who it is right now, but you know, I sold prints of that design and people like it and that kind of thing. And, and that's fine. Like you can, you don't have everything you make that you sell does not have to be set in stone for your project. Right. You can do whatever you want, but that's, that's part of the challenge of sharing your stuff early as well is that people are seeing it in progress and seeing the evolution and you have to be comfortable with that. Cause a lot of people aren't, you know, it's kind of a vulnerable place to be, to be showing your thing in progress. So I would just say, uh, if you're going to start a Patreon, or if you're going to start showing the work for the project, make sure you have enough, like understanding of what the project is, or at least the visual style down, like that kind of thing, that you feel comf confident that you can continue to deliver and continue to show people what you're doing, if that's what you want, if that's the way you want to go about it. Does that make sense? Makes absolute sense. Yeah. And especially like establishing you know, if you know that you want to make a certain amount of illustrations or a certain amount of art content, is that sustainable? Like mm -hmm. you were saying, it's like, can you deliver on that style? Yeah. Because I've seen people get really down and ambitious with what they're going to create. And they're like, oh yeah, it's going to be, you know, like, for example, for a comic, a long-term comic, it's fully shaded and beautifully rendered each page. And then they underestimate how many hours each page actually takes them. You know, they're just like, wow, like, each page takes me about 25 hours to get done. And I'm like, that's not sustainable. No. <laughs> you're, you're going to burn yourself out if you want to get this done with a schedule and in a timely manner and, you know, regular updates, et cetera. There's just no way. You have to figure out how are you going to simplify that for yourself and how to make it manageable. Still, obviously still high quality, but if you know that it's going to wear down on you to try to make something that's so complicated, um, it's not going, it's probably not going to get finished. And that's just the reality of the situation. There have been, there have been so many comics that I've read that st whose style has changed over the years or just like completely, like completely switched, like not just updated with their art improvement because that happens naturally. Right. But like they'll, um, they'll, they'll sometimes go from full color to black and white to like no shading and like, you know, and like vice versa. Like they'll just like, they'll experiment with things like during the road, which I, which I think is really cool to see kind of how artists like grow and improve. But it also like, it just tells me, it's like, yeah, you, you're realizing that this is not sustainable. Yeah, you yeah. have to push it up or else you're going to go crazy okay. unless you have more time to execute it, which is fine. Um, but it's, it's, it is really good to manage those expectations in the beginning as well. And just be like, okay, like I know what I'm capable of doing. I can be realistic with myself a little bit about how much time this takes to get done and if I'm willing to do it and if I want to do it you know, what kinds of things I love drawing, what kinds of things I don't like to draw, um, you know, all of that plays into a factor. <laughs> For example, there was a friend of mine who was like lamenting. She was like, I hate drawing wings. Like I hate drawing wings. My main character has wings. <laughs> then I have a villain that has six pairs of wings. I'm like, why? Why does it have so like what you hate drawing it? Why did you do this to yourself? 
like masochistic. <laughs> it's feathers. Like that's a lot of work. Yeah. At least get a bat wings, like do something, you know, <laughs> or like do a shorthand for it. Shorthands are really important too. Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah, kind of like, you know, like managing those expectations. Um scheduling is also a big thing that's important too. Um, you know, in the very beginning, it's okay, totally. For stuff to be pie in the sky and just be like yeah like you know i just this is what i want to accomplish this is what i want to do you know possibilities are endless the world is limitless but once you start to get down into the planning of things it actually is a really good method to start to set expectations you know those deadlines that you you were talking about mia of either self-imposed or imposed by event where you're like okay by this date i want to have written my first draft or i want to have done my character designs or, you know, et cetera, and try to adhere to that and try to make it realistic. You know, don't tell yourself that you're going to get um, 60 things done like I did um, by, the, by the end of a year, because that's a lot of stuff. Um, think about the amount of time it takes you to do what you need to do and then give yourself some padding to, you know, rest. Rest is important. Give yourself some days off even if you're doing something full time, if you're doing this full time, you're gonna need some space to rest and to recharge your batteries and to consume content and to feed yourself mentally as well as physically. Um, And I find a lot of people don't tend to do that. We tend to underestimate that even the stuff that we're making for our own creative sake is still technically some kind of work and we're not exactly resting. So you need to actually plan times to rest. It's really important. And just kind of like plot out your schedule. And if you can see something from the big picture and see that it could be realized that it could be realistic, I think that increases chances of actually getting the thing done in the first place. So yeah. that's at least my take. It could be different for you. How, how is it for you? I mean, I wish, I wish my scheduling was more structured, but honestly, for the first um, like all the way, basically actually all the way up until 2020, my, my schedule is pretty much predicated by my day job. If I had a night shift, if I had a, a day shift, um, and then on my days off, it would just be like, wake up, work, 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 eat, and then go to sleep. And it was just, that was just kind of it. And it was like, whatever I can squeeze out in, in terms of my schedule and stuff. And then if I had a show lined up, you know, paintings were definitely the priority. Um, but yeah, I feel like I, for something like what I'm doing, which is writing and art, uh, I kind of, I kind of have to have periods of time where I'm doing each, um, and that's sort of how I plan my time is around which of those I'm doing, um, yeah. and you know, like they each kind of inform each other. But in terms of like dedicated, getting you know chapters and chapters written, I can't be doing that and also painting a big painting or a big group of paintings, you know. And same with like building a body of you know three or four new paintings, I can't be writing at the same time. So at least for me, that compartmentalization is really important. Yeah. Um, and I just tend to, I guess the way I've scheduled it in past years has just been by, um, there's just so much to do, you know, it started obviously with like character design. Like, I think that was kind of the first thing for me. I need to know what my characters look like, you know? Mm-hmm. So I spent a lot of time there and definitely research. It's like, I need to know what this world is and that I'm building something that feels, um, you know, like that, that just feels like it's got weight to it or whatever um that it feels fleshed out and stuff and that takes years too you know it's like you could research for a few months and then work on something and just realize oh there's more gaps to my knowledge it's just like everything else so i try to give myself some flexibility in the sense that i guess for me it's like i like structure but i also don't want to feel like i'm at my day job when i'm working on my passion project so i need to give myself some room to play and for me that is like you need to do something from this list but you get to choose what you feel like doing today and then just stick to that until you get that thing done and that's kind of how I approach it. And to that point, what I wanted to say is like, I, I feel like when I was working, especially at my most recent restaurant, it was it almost felt corporate, like the way everything was so delineated, it had rules for everything. It had, you have to serve with a certain hand, like, you know, like down to the T, you know? Wow. And, and if like, if I was to take that and say, that's how I should pr- plan this project, that just would not work. Yeah. I am not that, you know, I'm not that corporation. I'm not that restaurant. You know what I'm saying? And like, it's regimented. Yeah, but I think a lot of us, if you have a day job and you see how things are done there, how they complete projects, how they get things done, how they organize, I think, at least for me, I tend to think, oh, I need to be like that for myself. And you don't. You're a totally different person and you are one person doing all these jobs. So you need to balance that however it works best for you, you know? And that's a lot of trial and error. That's like years of this worked and then 
and then now it suddenly doesn't work and I have to come up with a new thing. So I think for me, it's just like, I know I need structure, but I also need room in that structure to, like I said, to, to play or to feel like I have some choice in the matter. Yeah. <laughs> All this yeah. stuff needs to get done, but it, you know, the order, which if it doesn't matter as much, that's where I get to be flexible. So, yeah, I think in that regard too, self-awareness is really important in yeah. understanding what your methods are and how you work because trying to shoehorn yourself into a method that is opposite of your personality is usually not gonna go very well. Yeah. So, you know, for example, if you're the kind of person who is very nebulous and likes to play things fast and loose, which is fine, it's valid. It may not get the most things done, but um, if you're trying to regiment yourself every single day and just trying to, you know, make, like, okay, like now at 1 p.m. I'm gonna do this task, you know, like just getting like very granular about things, then, you have to be realistic of whether or not you're actually gonna to stick to that and what method works best for you. Like if you have a general idea of what you wanna accomplish, but you end up veering off and doing something else for the project instead, sometimes that could be valid. Sometimes you wanna tighten that up. Sometimes you wanna loosen it up a little bit, but understanding what works for you over time is a work in progress. And as you fine tune it, you can really start to work with yourself in getting the thing done. A lot of managing a big project is being your own boss. And being your own boss means that you have to take yourself seriously enough to actually listen to yourself mm -hmm. and listen to what you actually have to do. And that's really hard for a lot of people because when we don't have anybody telling us what to do, it's very easy to veer off and not do it. So how do you get to that point where you take yourself seriously enough to accomplish a thing is the question that I think, you know, people should ask themselves a little bit more when they're, when they're doing projects. It's a question I ask myself often because oftentimes I'll establish a habit or a precedent and then I'll fall off of that habit. I think I talked about this in the, in the 2020 episode and, or no, the organization episode. And then, um, and then I'll realize that, you know, that habit doesn't actually work for me. Maybe I can try this other thing instead. And, you know, after a while I start to kind of adjust to what is actually, what is actually good for me, what is actually bad. I can throw those old things away establish new things and then build on top of those new things. And eventually I'll have a good working schedule and I'll have something that doesn't make me feel um, burnt out. So it's really important to understand who you are and how you work and how you listen and to learn and grow from it, but, but have it as a starting point at the very least. And so it's a healthy relationship to have with yourself. Definitely. I would almost like one thing that I wish I had done differently and that I would suggest to somebody thinking about starting something big is almost like do a short story version of your project or a short story in your world first and almost like a trial period and see how you work, how you get this thing done, mm -hmm. what you learn from that, and then apply those lessons to the bigger project. Cause you know, we all start out saying it's going to be 300 pages. There's going to be 20 characters in every piece. There's going to be perspective and like fully rendered. <laughs> and you'll be at that for a hundred years and you still won't be done if you, if that's if that's what you're planning but then but yeah if you're if you're actually completing a project you'll have you'll realize what you have to compromise on whether it's the style whether it's like maybe five col full colors and everything else is black and white uh, in terms of illustrations or maybe you collaborate with someone who's going to help you write it and you uh, illustrate it and maybe you don't have to be the one that writes it or maybe you don't have to be the one that illustrates it whatever um but i feel like yeah if you if you start with something small and maybe that's the thing you kickstart if you do want to go that route and then that can help fund the next thing that's another way to go about it as well oh, yeah. absolutely yeah it doesn't have to start with the, the big huge pie in the sky idea at first and that's that's actually a really good point because that's the, the method that i started to take with my story as well because i was really beginning to get intimidated about the scope of my story and the scope of the world that i was presenting everything in but the virtue of having a world means that you can tell multiple stories within that same setting so I realized that I could just write snippets of little stories and make those and see kind of like introduce them to the, you know, to the public and in smaller ways. Yeah. I experimented with that when I was doing my um, October drawing challenge and just started to add snippets of little stories that could be set in this universe that I created. And it was really cool to see the reception to that and to see that people were interested in it. And it was, it was just a good way to test it. So, you know, it can, it can help you build your confidence with the story and give you some validation of, you know, if what you're writing is viable, like you can see people respond to it. And that's, that's another way to get your instant gratification right there yeah. is that you kind of like, you kind of get to see how 
people can look at this and perceive it. And you can fine tune it based off of the response or, you know, or, you know, work on it on your own, but it's a good way to get out that initial anxiety of just something that's so huge. Because when you look at you, when you feel like you have the whole world on your shoulders, you're not going to want to move. Yeah. But if you cut it, you know, if you cut the project down to little pieces and make them presentable, make them bite-sized, it's much, much more easier to consume. That's why you make it bite-sized. And that's, that's definitely something I've been learning and it's been really, really helpful. So I've been, um, what I've been doing with this project uh, since 2013, when, around when I actually started writing it seriously, uh, well, I guess I wasn't really writing it seriously then either, but I, you know, I just, I wrote down different aspects of the world and broke down, you know, what the history was, what the characters were, what, how the mechanics work. There's a lot of things to consider because it's a story with mechanics, it's a fantasy setting. So um, I had to figure out how the systems work, how's the magic work, how do the rules of this world work? And then um, kind of like chunk that out, start to consume other content and see how similar things had done it in the past so I don't repeat those things or I can take the things that I want from them but making them my own too. Um, that's another really important thing. Yeah. Nothing under the sun is really original. Mm -hmm. So it's okay if you take inspiration from different pieces of content and actually giving yourself time to consume content is really, really healthy because it can keep your well full of ideas and inspiration and see how, oh, they accomplish it this way. That's interesting. I never thought of that before. You can apply that to your own story or go the completely opposite route where you're like, okay, they, this has already been done. So what can I do here? But you have to make time for yourself in order to do that. Um, and so I've been breaking it down into like little snippets like that of just like, okay, here's these characters, here's these stories, here's these moments between these two characters. Um, this is kind of how I wanted to play out. This is kind of how I wanted to look. And the designs and the stories and what I actually want there and what I wanted to say with the story has changed over the years mm -hmm. as I've matured, as I've experienced more life, as I've experienced, you know, crazy world events. Um, it's naturally going to change mm -hmm. and that's totally normal and that's okay. Um, but it can, it can be scary for a lot of people because they're, you know, you look at your project now and you're like, wow, it's, it's changed so much, you know since I've had it when I first started, like, what do I do with this? But just, you know, ride with it. But eventually you will have to tie something down if you want to get the thing done. So if you can get your mission statement out a little bit, you know, like ahead of everything, you don't have to do it at the very beginning. But if you have a good idea of what you want to say, try to figure out a way to say it in a, in, you know, in a way that gives the world what you're trying to convey. And then you can fine tune it later or grow it and evolve it. But if you have a solid foundation, that's a really good start for your project in the first place. Like Mia, you were talking about your story before and you know, you, it was about your relationship with your sister. That is a part that is unwavering. I'm mm -hmm. assuming that's a part that's never going to change. Yeah. And that's why you're continuing to stick with that story. So having a strong mission statement in the beginning or, you know, around when you're like about to start to get things down on paper, is really, really important and really good to keeping that project, you know, grounded, even as things shift and change around you. Yeah, and I think, I think another important thing to talk about too is falling out of love with your big project. And the fact that well, as you change and grow, because, you know, big projects usually takes over the course of years, um, sometimes what the project is is no longer what you want to work with. And I think that's completely normal and natural. Yeah. And the sooner that you can recognize that and the sooner, like it, if it, like if every day you get to work on this thing and it starts to feel like a chore, then it's probably a good sign that it's probably not meant to be worked on anymore. And maybe this energy could be channeled into something that would be more meaningful to you now. Have you had that experience before with a big project? Like, I don't know if this is your first one or, um, if you've had others in the past that you've had to drop eventually, but I've definitely had this experience before. So, I mean, it was something I came up with in art school. I think also because I was insecure in my writing at the time and I was not, I, I was getting a lot of mixed reactions between my mentors and things like that. Um, and so I was afraid of putting a personal connection uh, to my work at that yeah. time. And I think, and I think that's part of what we were talking about earlier, that if you don't have that, that personal connection, that through line, it is easier to, to shelve things because you kind of run out of, of steam in a way. And yeah. that's what happened. I, I was like, this is a really cool project, but I just shelved it and kind of moved on with things in my life. And then when I was, I had that, 
you know, really rough time in, in my life where I was feeling sort of separate from my sister, I kind of was the same time that I was coincidentally looking through my projects and saw this one. And as I started trying to get back into it, it was putting that personal connection to the story that kind of made it all click together. Mm -hmm. so, like I've always kind of done self-directed work. And so that's maybe not a fair comparison. Cause I think there, there are people like my boyfriend, for instance, that because he had to work for so many people like doing freelance and stuff, by the time he was ready to do his own stuff, it actually took him a long time to figure out what he wanted to say with his own project. Yeah. Because he had associated art making with making art for other people that he kind of didn't know what he wanted to do anymore. I think that there is an element of that too. If you're, if you're, um, if your career has mostly been making art for other people, um, it's completely normal to feel like you're searching for what meaningful thing is for you, like what yep. the art making means to you and what it symbolizes. Um, but I think what you said is right on. If it ever starts feeling like a chore, definitely put it aside because it's it could be something that speaks to you 20 years from now. And that's just, yeah. just keep everything. Don't throw anything away. Well, do not throw anything yeah. away. <laughs> it's actually really, really fascinating to see how you develop an idea and how you like grow something. There was, it was a comic that I did a long time ago when I was in uh, grad school that I still have my planning journal for, because I love that comic and I still love it. Um, it had a very clear mission statement. And I was just like, I was trying to get into the groove of writing something else again. And I'm like, how did I get into that mode where I wrote this story? And I was able to find the journal and actually look at my process and, you know, like see how I broke it down and see how I drafted everything out. And I just wrote it in pencil. Just, it felt very impermanent and very easy. But because it was so fluid and so loose, and I planned each page out, what each page was, which each page was supposed to convey and represent, and like seeing how I developed that idea and fine tuned it, really helped me with writing something, you know, the thing that I wanted to write in the present. So yeah, your past self, you know, if you had things and you had ideas, there's always value to be drawn out of that. And that's the thing. It's like for something really ambitious and like a really big project or even a small project, I feel like you should try to put something of yourself in it. And, and it's a vulnerable thing to do. Like if you don't, if you're not comfortable with writing about that stuff, it could just be a visual art project and you can hide it with metaphor or whatever it is. But even if you're the only one who knows what that story is about, I feel like it is so important to put that in, to put that through because people will sense that connection, you know? Yeah. yeah they will definitely be able to feel it 100%. If it's authentic to yourself, they will like even if they don't get the exact message that you were intending to put out they get something out of it because you had something to say mm -hmm. and there's a reason why there's so many things that are intriguing to us because that mission statement remains strong throughout the whole project that you know that overall message and i found that those have been my strongest stories when i had a clear thing that i wanted to say um you know like i like either like whether it was from an experience or something i firmly believed in or even a dream it just like and how like what it evoked and how it made me feel there's so many different ways to put yourself into what you're doing and you know as long as you kind of identify what that is i i do recommend doing it you know like you can have a framework and like you know like with you mia um and then like put something in the heart of it kind of like an automaton and like you put like the core into it and now it's like moving like that's, that's what it feels like mm -hmm. um you know it feels like it has a soul now and you want to give it life because it has that soul like you just keep building on top of it and i feel like that's been the hardest thing for this project that i had is because i think that it was missing its soul for a while and so what i had to do was infuse the soul into the little snippets and then through those snippets realize what the bigger picture was trying to say and that's the current process that i'm in now and i think i'm really close to what it what it is that i actually want to say so I'm honestly kind of like considering tearing it all down and starting from the ground floor up in the same world, of course, yeah. but just reformatting the whole story. Sometimes you'll have to do that because whatever you put in there is not working for you. And that's, it's scary because like you get married to things. Yeah. It's really hard to unmarry yourself from certain things, but <laughs> if you know it's not working, it's better to be realistic about it and know that it's going to be tortured if you don't take it out now. And so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm just like, okay, I think I had to like, all these things that I committed to, like, I don't think that's going to work because it wasn't, it wasn't telling me anything. There was no, there wasn't a purpose. It needs to be driven by something. And sometimes you just have to, you know, you have to start from scratch in order to kind of like realize that thing that you want to say now. Oh yeah. I've torn my story apart at least four times. And it was, I had the whole thing mapped out and it's like, there are parts of it that remain. And that's, 
Um, that's the thing. I, I feel like it's it's hard when there's expectations of a certain you know story and there's beloved characters. But if it's your own story, you can do whatever you want. No one will ever know that yep. the characters aren't in the position that they should yep. be. You know. Um, but yeah, it's just uh, as long as you're moving forward and you're making you're you're making the story stronger and leaner and more you know like it's just communicating to the audience in a more direct way. Just strip everything out. It's almost like like bring it down to its essence, you know, and, and there's a lot of stripping away that will happen. And it, again, it'll feel like a bunch of wasted work, but it's not, it was all necessary. No, it all led you to a point that allowed the project to, you know, gain legs. And sometimes it doesn't. And maybe that allows a pro another project to gain legs in its stead. Yeah. So, you know, and that has to be okay. Again, like with a big project, there's so much pressure because you think it feels like it's the only thing that you get to create. And you're like, this has to be my magnum opus. But why? Yeah. Why does it have to be the magnum opus? Why does it have to be the best thing or the only thing that you make? It doesn't. And it's probably not going to be. So allow yourself to make the mistakes. Allow yourself to go through the process and to tear it down and to build it back up and to change it over time and let it become what it needs to become. But that takes time. That takes patience. And that takes dedication. And sometimes it takes a break from the project because I've done that too. I've, I've definitely... I visited the project, I did it in one way, and then I revisited the project maybe uh, three years later, did it a different way, and it's still in my head somewhere, and it, right now it's on the table, but it's it's a story that I can tell maybe again if I want to another day, and maybe it'll have a different message when I tell it again, but it's totally okay because that idea existed somewhere, and whatever version it exists in, it's told only the way that you're going to tell it, and that's, that's what makes it special. Yeah. And actually to that point, like, let's say your idea is something that is kind of in the, what's that word? The, it's like the collective unconscious. Is that even a thing? The zeitgeist? Yes, the zeitgeist or something. Let's just say it's just like, I, I know at the time when zombies were really popular, everybody was writing their zombie story. Yeah. And there is this temptation that you're just like, I've been working on this for so long and zombies, like it's the time to make it. Don't even listen to any of that. You know, it's like there's there's no timeline for the thing. You can't you can't rush art, right? That's a I know that's a quote somewhere, but it's like just make the thing because you're making it because you want to because there's a connection. But it's like all that other stuff is noise. Like it, it might seem like the perfect time to release it at a certain time when that thing is trending or it's you know people are you know paying attention to it or whatever. But um, I guess what I'm saying is just like, keep focused, keep your eyes on the prize. It's all about the story and none of that other stuff matters, honestly. And it's like, if it's a good story, people will want to hear it 50 years from now, 10 years from now, you know, five years ago, it doesn't matter. But I know people tend to panic about that kind of thing. And, or, or I know that there's people that plan their art around what's, you know, in vogue now. And I think that's a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. It, it works for some people, but it, I feel like it's so stifling because it's, it's just limiting yourself into what you actually could be making yeah. and you know something that's true to yourself obviously it also is really helpful because it gets you more followers and it gets you more notice but it's like a spike that immediately goes back down yeah. so i feel like I, the way that i always love to operate is to make content that feels timeless to yeah. me like even you know with my art with my stories um i just i don't like to i never like to go on what's trending i just like to go on what is important to me yeah. at the time well do you have any final thoughts that you'd want to mention in terms of what you'd like to say to people that are starting their own project yeah i i will just say um it's okay to have an ambitious you know point of view or like kind of idea about what your project should be but make sure that it's really something that you want to work on and something that you want to create first and foremost it should mean something to you because if it doesn't and it's a long-term project then maybe it's not the best long-term project to do. Maybe that should be a smaller you know, project instead that's more manageable because a long-term project really does take a lot of time, dedication and love to get it done, to not be paid and to still see the road ahead and want to forge forward because you believe in it. So first and foremost, just make sure you believe in what you're trying to do. And if you fall out of love with it, that's okay. If it transforms to what you initially thought it would be, that's okay. And if it stayed the exact same way that you had expected it to be when you started it out, then that's beautiful and that's also okay. So don't put too much stress on yourself and don't let it, you know, don't let it burn you out. Try not to let it burn you out as much as you can. Be healthy about it and take care of yourself. Yeah, definitely. That's awesome. I actually want to remember one last thing I wanted to say is that 
community is so important. Yes. And that's some, one of the biggest lessons I learned about this project for so many, for so many years, I was trying to do this all myself. And I think we have this myth that artists should only do something all by themselves. And that's just not true. It, artists, scientists, you know, writers, thinkers, everybody who you think of as one name had a whole team around them. And that's something one of my good friends taught me. And that's true for everybody. And so whether you are trying to apply for a grant and maybe you don't know how to write about your project, reach out to somebody that does, that can, you know, help you with that. Um, and that, that stuff takes years too, you know, building a network of people that are just friends of yours that will want you to succeed and you'll help them succeed and you just help each other and, and always, you know, trade skills with people. You know, if somebody helped you out and got you out of a pinch or, you know, did a graphic design for you or something, find ways to do something for them too. Mm -hmm. And that's how we grow as a community and how we'll get all our stories out there together. But seriously, it's like, it's a huge pro if it's a huge project and it has a bunch of skills, you are just one person please lean on the people around you and ask them to teach you, ask them to help in any way. Um, yeah. Anyway, that was one of the biggest lessons I learned for sure. That's a huge thing for sure. I think one of the most important things when you're doing a big project like this is to get somebody to listen to you talk about the idea out loud. Mm -hmm. Vocalizing something makes so much difference. I promise you, it really changes how you see the project and how other, you, how other people respond to it. You can understand what it sounds like and what it looks like. It just hits different. Yeah. So make sure that, you know, you don't be like, once you're ready to talk about it, don't be afraid to talk about it with somebody that you trust and know and whose opinion you value and try to be as open to feedback as you can. You don't have to take all of their feedback, but be receptive to change because something, sometimes things won't work and you won't realize what those things are until you actually tell somebody about it. But I think it's really exciting to be able to share your story. And if you have somebody you can do that with, I think that's really special. So definitely, definitely do that with your, you know, with your trusted person. That's awesome. Well, I think that's a great place to, to end this. Uh, and I hope that some of you will be inspired to tackle your project, whether it's big or small. Um, but thank you so much for joining us this week and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>